blessing to be here the UBC TV and it's always an honor to bring the word of God to you. I thank God for the opportunity to be here once again and I thank God for you that you always tune in and I pray and believe that God is blessing you and even this morning I pray that the word of God will come in such power and anointing of the Holy Spirit. The Lord, you will change lives, you will heal, you will redeem and that your name will be glorified. Father, we thank you. Open the eyes of understanding and help us to receive from you in Jesus' mighty, glorious, wonder-working name. 2 Timothy chapter 4. 2 Timothy chapter 4 is um, one of the last writings of the Apostle Paul recorded in the scriptures. And the Apostle Paul is now an elder, elderly man. He's um, advanced in age and... Uh, not only that, but he knows that his time has come. The Bible says that uh, it's appointed for men to be born and to die once. And they are after judgment. And death is an appointment that comes to all of us. But it doesn't matter uh, who we are or what name or a status or uh, color or creed or uh, background. Death is an appointment. And the Apostle Paul knows that his appointment has now come, and he writes the rumblings of a dying man. Not a dying man without hope, but a dying man that has touched the world. A dying man that has touched the world. Paul, an anointed man of God. Paul, called on the road to Damascus. Paul, who spent three years in the desert, uh, downloading and receiving from the Lord and confirming and affirming his call before he could step out after being looked by Barnabas. Paul, who preached and uh, uh, left the whole city and all the powers of darkness turned upside down, and he had to be carried through a basket between the wall to get to the next destination. Paul, who had been stoned and left for death and, and, and only saved, it is believed, by this young man, Timothy, that is now writing to uh, in his last days and last words of his life. Paul, who preached one time so long and so powerfully that a man fell from the window and died. And he walked down, raised him up again, and continued to preach. Paul, oh, it is this Paul who writes to us the mysteries of the word of God. And he teaches us about the grace of God. He teaches us about gifts. He teaches us about the church, that we are one body, and we are a body, but different parts, and each body supplying. We put the body together and keep it alive. It is Paul who teaches us about fruits. He tells us about gifts, and he differentiates gifts from fruits, and he tells us who we should really be. It is Paul who teaches us about love and places love high above all else. And he says it is love working in faith that sums up the whole law. It is Paul who turned and changed cities. He turned and changed churches with the word of his pen without even showing his face. He could write letters like he wrote and rectified issues in churches and put people in line. It is Paul who could write a letter to people he had never seen and give them instructions and they followed them and those instructions later became inspired word of God. This is the Paul that is now in his last days. And for such a man, when he is in his last days, the words he teaches, the words he speaks, the, 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 the treasure is like the last residue in a glass. If you were taking any drink or juice or whatever you take, it's the last residue in the glass. It is the last residue in the cup that have the strongest ingredients. And now Paul is uh, turning the cup out, upside down. He writes and says, For I am already being poured out as a drink, verse 6, as a drink offering, and the time of my departure is at hand. I'm already being poured out. My life is just releasing the last residues there can be. 
as it were, I'm about to go and meet my master and Lord that I've served faithfully for so many years that I've lived after my rebellion against him and my encounter on the road to Damascus. And he says, my, and the time of my departure is at hand. I can feel the bell ringing and saying, it's next. It is next. The bell and the screen, the number on the screen and the number on my coupon, appointment coupon, they tally. And I know my time has come. And you know that all of us, our time will come. And when your time comes, remember there is your turn. So when it is your time, it, it's the time to do the things that you have to do in your last days. It is the time when you have to do the things that you have to do last. Because after your time has come, there is your turn. If you have ever waited in queue, maybe for an appointment for a doctor, your appointment might be at 10 a.m. That is your time of your appointment. And then you get to the doctor's office, the, doc the clinic or the hospital, wherever you go, and uh, you have to fill in the forms and your details, and your files are being looked for. And, but it is your time. It's your appointment time. It is 10 a.m. And then your file will be looked up and the details will be taken and then you'll be told to wait. And after you wait, and, and you will wait, and somebody, the nurse or the, the PA or whatever it is to the doctor will come and tell you, the doctor will see you in 15 minutes. By that time, it may be 10, 15. And you wait along and you probably take a tea or coffee or some water and you look at the magazine and you watch an episode or, or something and preparing you for the appointment and the doctor is looking through your records and is, is taking notes and consulting and, and looking at what, what your history has been and what is affecting you or what your checkup is bringing up and then your turn will come. And when your turn comes, you see the doctor. So it may be your time, but your turn is coming. That's why this word is coming to you. It is your time. It is your season, but you have to wait for your turn. And that is very important. Some of us are in our times, are in our seasons, but we are very so impatient to wait for our turn. And so we lose it. We blow it. But the Apostle Paul knows it is his time. And these are the words that he says. The opening verses are, are such verses. He is exhorting. He gives a charge to Timothy. He gives a charge to Timothy uh, by, 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 by the pen. By, by, by the pen. He, he, he writes. Uh, and, and, and he is probably using a secretary now. He can't write by himself. He's old and, and, and uh, he, 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 he's old and he has to dictate to somebody and says, I charge you, Timothy, preach the word. I charge you, Timothy, preach the word. He, th these are the words that he passes to Timothy. And he says, preach the word. Preach in season, preach out of season. Preach in season and preach out of season. Be ready to preach the word. Uh, because the Lord Jesus, uh, the, the time has come that I will appear before the Lord Jesus and take on my crown, and not only for me, but for all those who look forward to his appearing. You know, there is, uh, when you look forward to the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, the way you live, the way you spend your money, the way you spend your time, the way you, you, you take yourself, the way you treat others will be different. Because the caution that the Lord gives us, and he says, I will come like a thief in the night. We live like this is our last day, and we walk like we, will, we are not going to leave this place. You see, So the way we live really matters. And there is a crown. There is a crown that waits for those that look forward to the appearing of the Lord. And the appearing of the Lord will create the fear of the Lord in you. And this is the Apostle Paul. He's the Apostle of Grace. You know, with all due respect to our Lord Jesus Christ, who himself is the grace. He says, the law came through Moses, but grace and truth came through the Lord Jesus Christ. And out of his fullness, we have all received. He is grace and his truth. Two very dichotomous things to stay alive. They are antithesis. If you know the truth of somebody, 
about somebody, sometimes it is very hard to show them grace. If you knew who I really was, that God knows, maybe you would think, or maybe you think, I don't deserve the grace that God has given me because of the truth that you know about me. Yet God in his mercy and grace, he has showed me grace and mercy. The apostle Paul says, I am the chief of sinners, but God has counted me faithful and called me into the ministry. And grace and truth coming through our Lord Jesus Christ. And when we look forward to his appearing, everything changes. The way we live our lives changes. And here is the apostle Paul now in prison in Rome and he knows that any time he will be going to the gallows he will be ex executed and his time his time has come and he writes to to Timothy these beautiful words beautiful words they they are not um, they are not expository this is not a continuous uh, uh, a teaching that you could follow no Paul talks about Timothy preaching well, and then he talks about uh, how he's going and how his life is being poured out as a drink, and then he talks about how he has been abandoned, and then he talks about how the Lord is faithful, and then he tells him to come in winter before winter, and he tells him, come quickly, and, and Paul, his life is being poured out as a drink, and he is at a time of transition. He's a time at, of transition. He's transiting. Something out of his life is being poured out, and he wants to pour it on the life of Timothy. It is, it is a crossing over. And I came today to speak to you this word because we are at a time of crossing over. We are at a time of transition in, in the church, uh, in, in our country. Believe it or not, the, there is a transition that we are in. And it is a time that we have to look at the principles of the Word of God because they are the only principles that don't lie. Sometimes the principles of history, of, of political science, of, of economics, and they, they are taken aback because of precedences and things that have never happened before. The dynamics change and professors come up and they justify the change in the predictions, uh, weather predictors, the weather focus changes. They come and they tell us how this season got to be A, B, C, D, and things happen. And they come up and they apologize. And they say, due to unforeseen circumstances, things change. But we have a God who doesn't change. He is immutable. He doesn't change. He says, uh, because I change not, you sons of Jacob, are not consumed. And when we come to times like these, you might despise the church, you might despise the preacher, you might look down on the word of God, but the word of God cannot be ignored because it is the word, the very breath, the inspired word of the Son of God, the, the God Almighty, the Elohim, the Elion, the, the El Shaddai, the, the omniscient God, the omnipotent, the omnipotent, the all-knowing, the all-powerful God. He, he knows the beginning from the end. And when we look through the principles of God, we are sure not to go astray. And we look at the life of Paul, an apostle, a man of God. A man who turned the world upside down with the gospel. He, he, he desired to touch every known world there was in his day with the word of God. And God granted his desire. And he has reached Rome. And in Rome, he's there and he's in prison. You know, somebody said that there are two greatest prisoners on earth. Two greatest prisoners on earth. And one, he talked about Napoleon. Bonaparte, if you're a history student or if you're a student of current affairs and, 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 uh, and, and governess and leadership, you would not miss Napoleon Bonaparte. I went to school, I studied history, but I didn't study the kind of history that uh, allowed me to study about Napoleon Bonaparte in class, but I did my best to study about him because I went to school with other students that were, were talking about Napoleon Bonaparte. And, and I got interested and studied, uh, personally studied about him. And he, he was in prison. He died in prison. And he, he had won many battles, but winter, winter conquered him. And he is in, in prison. And when he was in prison, he, he wondered. 
He said, is there anybody who really loves me? Is there anybody who really loves me? He had spent his life conquering, shedding blood so that his legacy and his life and his empire could be established. And then there is another prisoner called Paul and he is in Rome and he's not in, in prison in winter but he's seeing winter coming. He's not conquered by winter but he's conquering winter by preparing before winter. And he says while in prison these words. He's not wondering whether anybody loves him but in prison his eyes are open to see who really loved him and who did not. And above those on earth who could not love him, there was one that loved him unconditionally. And he says that when on my first time of trial, everyone, everyone abandoned me, but the Lord was with me. You see, Napoleon Bonaparte, after conquering the, the world, his world, and bringing his dreams and working well, however he worked, to bring his dreams to pass, he ends up in prison about to die and wonders if anyone loves him. And Paul is in prison and he's writing all these beautiful words. He's full of love. He's full of love. He's passing over a baton. He looks at all these people that are before him and he sees Timothy and he says, I'm passing the baton to you. And it is amazing Timothy does not shine so bright as Paul shone because we shine in different ways. You see, many times we think that if I catch the baton of, Timothy, of, of, of Paul, then as Timothy, I'm supposed to write double the books that Paul wrote. I'm supposed to do triple the miracles that Paul did. I'm supposed to travel five times the way uh, Paul traveled, but it doesn't happen with Timothy. He receives the baton and we hear less about him, but through this portion of scripture, we know that he has the mantle of Paul. And that's a, t a, a lesson to us. We are going to shine differently. The Lord in his grace and in his mercy will allow us to shine differently. You may be in office today and shine differently. The next CEO will shine differently. You may be the minister of that ministry today and you shine that bright. But the next person that comes after you that is supposed to take that ministry that is presupposedly taking an, a mantle from you and going on a different level because we grow from glory to glory and from power to power. And that's how ministry grows. You may perform so many miracles. Your successor may perform less. But it doesn't mean they are less anointed. It doesn't mean they are doing less. No, God in his mercy and grace decides that that person will shine a different way. And these are principles that we need to teach ourselves and teach our churches and teach this nation. It's very important because we, we, we live in a business of comparison. If this has been good, then the person that is coming, if this one looked good, the other one must look better. If this one spoke good English, the one that takes over must speak uh, better English. The, if this one was trained at Macquarie, the one who takes over must be trained at Harvard. It doesn't work that way. And the Bible shows us that. You see, the leadership is walking yourself out of the job. Good leadership is when a leader walks himself out of the job by training a successor to take over from him. Some people's light can flow into one person. Some other people's lives flows into uh, a, a, a handful. I'll give you an example. The life of Elijah was poured into the life of Elisha. David poured his life into Solomon. But after Solomon, the, the life of David, the anointing on David for the throne could not be contained by his son. So the kingdom was torn apart for whatever reason. You could give all the theological reasons, you could give all the political reasons, economic reasons why his son Rehoboam and, Rebo Re Re Je and, and the other guy could not be together, but whatever they are, the, 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 the anointing could not be contained in one container. 
So it was divided into a few containers. And that is it. You know, Moses could pour his life into Joshua. But after Joshua, we see the judges. And that's how it is. You see, we, we cannot change that. And we see the life of Abraham. And Abraham pours his life into Isaac. And Isaac pours his life into Jacob. And Jacob pours his life into 12 sons. 12 sons. And from 12 sons, the 12 sons could not contain that anointing. They pour it into 12 tribes. And the 12 tribes could not contain it. They pour it into a nation called the Hebrew nation, which is now the nation of Israel. You see? So Jesus, one man, one man, truth, full of truth, grace and truth, and, and all these, the Son of God, the living God, God in the flesh, the Word made flesh. You know, he could not be, it could not be poured into one person. He poured it into 12 apostles. And that's how it, it is. Sometimes it is one person that takes over. At other times, it is a handful. It's quite a few. It could evolve into departments. It could develop into different departments and, and different establishments. That's how the anointing works. And you can look through the Bible, and the Bible goes on to tell us genealogies, and, and Adam begat so-and-so, and so-and-so begat so-and-so, and so-and-so begat so-and-so. And you say, why are they telling us all this? They are telling us how the anointing flowed, how it got to you, how it got to me. There is nothing that you have. There is nothing that I have that is ours. It was given to us. It is very important. There is nothing that you have in ministry that is yours by yourself. You have it because somebody gave it to you. And that person had it because another gave it to him. Because God is the source. And Paul, after having all these people around him, he has people around him already. He has breathed into their lives already. But he looks to them and he says, I want to get Timothy right here. There is something in my life. There is a part of the anointing of the residue on my life that I have to pour on Timothy. And I want to dwell on two verses in the interest of time. I pray that by the grace of God, when we have another time, we will speak again in this scripture. The Lord will surely speak to us. And this is a very emotional part of the Bible. If you can look in Paul's eyes, he's probably writing with teary eyes, and, but with a big smile. If you can read that from the book of Philippians. He's in prison, but smiling and commanding and rejoicing. And Paul is looking forward at the brighter days ahead. He's looking forward at the revivals that are about to come in the future. He's looking at the lives that are going to be impacted. The Laodicean church is looking at the Ephesian church. He's looking at the elevation of Timothy as uh, a, a bishop, as a minister of the word of God. How he's going to move in the anointing and power of the Holy Spirit. How he's going to touch nations and, and move places. How the mantle is being passed from Paul, from the apostles uh, to, to the next generation, remember Paul and the Apostle Peter, around the same time, they are passing on the batons, and they are in Rome at the same time, and Rome is the seat of government, is the seat of power at that time, and Timothy is being called to a place to receive the baton, and I want to read verse number 9, and it says, be diligent to come to me quickly. Be diligent to come to me quickly. Paul is, is seeing that the, the days, the uncertainty of the days ahead. And he's saying, Timothy, if you don't get this mantle from me, the days are going to be uncertain. I've written to you in chapter 3 and told you that perilous times are coming. People will be boasters. People will be lovers of themselves. People will be slanderers. People will be lovers of evil rather than lovers of good. People will be boasters. People will be despisers of good. People will not respect their parents. People will be, will be uh, 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 having itching ears, the Bible says, and they will put up and, and heap up teachers for themselves, teachers that teach what they want. And I have a mantle, and I have something that I need to pass to you that you should not miss. And be diligent to come to me quickly. Be diligent 
to come to me quickly. Don't wait. Don't wait. My life is being poured out. And I want to speak to, to somebody today. I don't know what the Lord is telling you to be diligent to do. I don't know. Maybe it is a ministry that you have to start now. Maybe it is a book that you have to, to, to write now. Maybe it is a home, a house that you have to build now, a home that you have to build for that beautiful wife, for that beautiful, uh, handsome husband that has loved you so much, for those children that may be young, that may be, may be but, but, but God is saying build that home. Maybe it is a company that you have to start. Maybe it is a degree that you have to go study. You may say, I'm 40, I'm 50, I'm 30, I'm 60, it don't matter. Be diligent to come to me quickly. Maybe it is a relationship that you have to rebuild. Maybe with your pastor, somebody that raised you. You know, we come from a generation that don't respect people that pour into their lives. This is the Apostle Paul, and he's on his deathbed. And he's calling. He's calling Timothy from a far land. Probably Timothy is in Laodicea and he's, he's calling him and saying, come. He's going to have to take a ship. He's probably going to have to take to change a few taxis. Maybe he's going to take a flight if it is our day. He's going to take some, he's, he will have to transit. Then he will take a taxi. Maybe he will change into a train to get to where Paul is. And, and Paul is not calling him because he has a lot of property. Because some of us are aligned to people if they have money, if they have something to give to us, if they have a big check to sign for us, they have a big property to pass on to us, they're going to give us letters of administration, oh, we're going to take up the estates of the so and so, we're going to take up the big ministry, we're going to be in the limelight, then we will run fast to go and sit around the deathbed of such people. They don't even have to call us, we call if everything, we, we will take a leave from work, and go sit there and be the last people to see them. But this is Paul. And if you read downwards, he, 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 says, he, he says, when you come, bring for me the, the clock. Bring for me the clock. The, the, this is one of the valuable things that Paul is saying. He's saying, bring for me the, the clock. Bring for me the cloth. Bring me the cloth. Uh, and, 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 and bring me the cloth and the books. And especially the parchments, you know. And these are the valuables that Paul is calling for. He's, he's not calling Timothy to pass him an estate, uh, you know. He's not calling Timothy to give him uh, the latest uh, 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 vehicle or truck or whatever that he has just bought, the man of God. He's not calling him so that he can pass him uh, the jet, the rights to the jet, uh, that the personal jet that the man of God has just bought. No, this is not what he's calling him for. He's calling him as a son to pass him the baton, to pass him something that is unseen. And that is what we have missed in our generation. We struggle for the seen, and we, we let the unseen pass for the things that are visible, the things that are visible are corruptible. The things that are, be, are visible are, are, are not permanent. They, they, they pass away. They, they, they are corruptible. They, they can go very, very fast. But the things that are not seen, they are permanent. They are incorruptible. And, and that's what God wants us to strive for. I'm not saying the, the things that are tangible are not good. No, we need them. We need the vehicles. If the Lord tells us, we will buy cars. We will buy the latest models. We will buy the best models. We will, they, for those who need jets, they will get the jets. Those who need ships, they will need ships. And they will get them. Those who need vehicles, if the Lord, sorry, the uh, buildings, if the Lord tells us, we will build. We are building. We will get nice buildings. We will put the, the best carpets. We will put the best decorations. We will put the best air conditioning there can be. But this is not what it is all about. And Paul says, Timothy, be diligent to come to me quickly. Do not waste time. Do not put this off. It is urgent. 
come to me quickly. I need to pass you this thing. I'm already like a drink being poured out. And there is something on my life that I need to pass on. And this word I'm speaking to you, our elders. I'm praying that God will raise up a generation of elders that are willing to pour into the young people. That what is on your life, you will not go to the grave with it. The apostle, uh, sorry, the prophet Elijah poured into the life of uh, Elisha. But Elisha had to be there. He told him that, what do you want? He said, I want a double portion of what is on your life. He said, you will have it if you see me being taken. If you are here when I'm being taken, you will have it. And he had to walk. He went through Bethel. You know Bethel, the house of God? He went through the house of God, the place where God descended and ascended, where angels ascended and descended on, on Jacob. And he passed that place. And he went through Jericho, the place of the fast victory. He, he took him through places of war, the place of fast victory, the place where the children of Israel stepped into the promised land, but they were held up by a war. They, their feet were in the promised land, but they could not see the promised land. Their eyes were still veiled. The Bible says that Jericho was shut up. It had huge walls, and the gates were sealed by reason of the children of Israel. In Joshua chapter number 6, you could step into your promised land, but when your, your, your eyes are walled, stepping into there, but not eating what you're supposed to eat, but God... In his mercy is changing that for you in the name of Jesus. And then he told him, stay here. And he couldn't stay. And he moved on. And he came to Jordan. And what is Jordan? Jordan was a replica of the miraculous power of God. God had parted the Red Sea. And the children of Israel had crossed. And now Elijah brings Elisha to Jordan. And he's putting a memory into his mind. And what is the memory? The memories of a Mount Carmel. He says, the God of fire, the God who answers by fire, the God of consuming fire, my God is your God. The God of Moses was the God of Joshua. He said, as I was with Moses, my servant, so shall I be with you. And Joshua writes at the end of his life and says, there is not a single word of all the things that God promised us that fell to the ground. He fulfilled all. And they come to Jordan and he strikes the water with the mantle and the water parts, and they cross the Jordan, and the, the chariots of fire, they come and pick up Elijah, and he's taken. And Elijah does not throw two mantles. He threw one mantle, but Elisha got a double portion. But the sad thing is that Gehaz, because he loved the things of this world, after Elisha had healed Naaman, the general from Assyria, he followed him quietly, and he begged, and he asked, and he lied, and he took the gold and the silver, and, and, and that was it. And he was struck by the leprosy of, of Naaman, and he couldn't take on the mantle, and Elisha went to the grave. He went to the grave with the mantle. And the Bible tells us that when Elisha was in the grave and there was a man they were taking to bury and there was a war, a trumpet or something and they threw the body into the grave of Elisha and his bones touched the bones, his body, dead body touched the bones of Elisha and he resurrected. Even in death, he could resurrect the dead. But he was set to do the right thing. But there was no body to pour into when they came to Jericho, he didn't touch anything. When Achan touched something, they couldn't take Ai for themselves. And he's walking this man through the things to remind him, to say, do not touch the accursed thing. Keep yourself pure and holy, and the Lord will bless you. And the apostle Paul walks Timothy through different places. Place number one, he tells Timothy, that I am poured out like a drink, be diligent to come to me vast. And he says, Demas has forsaken me, having loved the present world. You see, when you love this present world, you are sure going to forsake the Lord. You will miss this anointing. You will miss this pouring into your life if you love this present world. 
The Bible says that the love of money, 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 10, the love of things is the root of all evil. And I'm praying for you that God would deliver you from things, that things will not have you, that you will have the anointing enough to have the things. Number two, he says, Demas has forsaken me. Um, he has departed for Thessalonica, Titus for Dalmatia, Crescens for Galatia. Only Luke is with me. Luke is a physician, and that, that is somebody that you need. Luke is a physician, is a doctor. You need somebody beside you that can take of your physical body. Because as you grow old, your life is going to slow down. You either need a, a physician, trained physician, or you need to train somebody that knows you well. It doesn't matter who you are, parent, uh, boss at work, a businessman, minister of the word, you need a look around, a trained person, a physician, a, a, a trained person, uh, a skilled person around you. Tichikas is with me, uh, but I sent to, to, to Ephesus. Bring the clock, verse 12, uh, that I left at Cappus. You can imagine that kind of clock. What is that clock that Paul is crying out for? It's a clock that bears all the testimonies, the, the crying support, the clock that has seen his tears, the clock that has seen his victories, the clock that has had his songs, the clock that bears his blood, the clock that, that has seen the cold and the warmth. And he says, bring that clock. And the last verse that I want you to look at is verse 21 of 2 Timothy chapter 4. Do your utmost to come before winter. Child of God, there is a change of season. The Bible says that as heaven and earth abides, the seasons will be. There will be winter, there will be summer, there will be autumn, there will be spring. Uh, seasons change. But uh, when winter comes, the oil cannot flow. When winter comes, the oil will freeze. The water freezes. Whatever could have flown onto your life, into the lives of others, could not flow. Winter is coming. Uh, maybe you are a non-Christian, and I want to tell you there is winter coming. The seasons are changing. There is a time that is coming when you cannot travel, Timothy, when the sea cannot accommodate the sheep to get to me. I have something for you. Maybe this is the Lord's voice coming to you, whoever you are. And he's saying winter is coming when you cannot sit on the sheep, the winds, uh, the waters, uh, uh, the turmoil on the sea cannot allow you to come by winter. Come now. The Lord is speaking to you. Come to him now. Winter is coming when you can't travel. Today is the day of salvation. Today, if you call on the Lord, he will answer you. Today is the day for you to start that ministry, to start that church, to finish that project, to write that book, to endorse that person, to give out that job to promote that person. Don't wait for tomorrow. The Bible never talks of tomorrow because of the uncertainty of life. We don't know what tomorrow brings, but today is a gift that God has given us. Don't put off coming to the Lord. Don't put off going to visit your parents. Don't put off repairing that relationship. Don't put off serving the Lord. Don't put off sowing that seed, for you don't know what tomorrow will bring. Paul is saying, my life is being poured out as a drink, and don't wait. Don't procrastinate. Don't put this thing off, Timothy. Leave everything that you have to leave and come to me. And I want to encourage you to get up, to step up, and do what you are supposed to do. Now is the time. I want to pray for you. And the voice of the Lord to you also says, now is the time for your promotion. I'm not waiting for winter. I want to promote you now. I want to heal you now. I want to bless you now. I want to change your life now. I want you to come back home now. And I want to pray with you. Father, in the name of Jesus, your word has come forth. And your exhortation to us, your charge to us, come before winter. And we come to you. I bring the sick, I pray you heal them. Those in need, provide for them. Those that are disturbed, bring your peace. Those that are receiving you, heal them, save them, forgive their sins, and write their names in the book of life. Lord, those that are in a corner being pushed to the wall, send help from heaven and let your oil flow. 
We thank you, Lord. We give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. God richly bless you. Thank you for always tuning in. And I want to encourage you to be diligent to come to the Lord quickly. Be diligent to do what you're supposed to do quickly. For the night is far spent. The day is far spent. And the night cometh when no man walks. Our salvation is closer than when we first believe. The Lord is coming back soon. God bless you. Have a wonderful Sunday. Come and visit us. Give us a call. Communicate with us. Tell us about what the Lord is doing and show us that the Lord is ministering to you and we shall be encouraged. Be comforted, be blessed, and let the peace of God be with you. Shalom.